that. How do I do the share screen on there again? You just hit right down there. Share screen. Yeah. And then is it um Safari here? Is that the one? Safari. Um is that the one that I had open? I think so, yes. Oh yeah. And then that thing. I could be your laptop guy. Or the the Zoom stuff. All right, we got some people coming in. Come on in. Hello, Brooklyn. Reed. How's it going? Oh, yes, the wave back. <laughs> I'm keeping my distance from Rob, not because... I bite here and... Not because I'm weird like that, but... I'm aromatic. Be, be safe with this two meters of distance. Yeah, I'm excited. Tomorrow, Brooklyn and whoever else is on right now, we're doing a presentation for the Faculty of Rehab Med, so alumni. Um, we'll have Instagram open, uh, but we'll be mainly looking at the computer because it's going to be for the U of A's, but we're still going to have Instagram on, so it's going to be great to check out that because we're talking about prolonged sitting, posture, um, and we're going to do like an exercise program for it as well. So for people who work all day sitting down, especially from home, we're going to do uh, go through a stretching program that everyone can do and like a high intensity interval training. So a HIIT workout that you could do while sitting from home. So that's going to be really cool. There should be some, uh, some media coverage too. So CTV uh, in the morning, you'll see CTV morning live. You'll see Brandon on there. Um, and you can it's check really that cool. out. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I think it's gonna be like 8 30 or something like that in the morning So if you guys want tomorrow on CTV news live Brandon Pawelski our own Brandon Pawelski is gonna be on there talking about our presentation for the U of A So we're pretty much famous at this point <laughs> um, Yeah So that should be pretty good I think and again this voice is me Sonny Oh yeah, Sunny's from oh, yeah. over two okay. meters away from Rob. <laughs> um, yeah, so tomorrow's gonna be not nice. Everyone tune in. We'll give it a couple more minutes. I think there's a few latecomers, but we'll get started. Yeah. We had a switch. Sorry for the switch up today, guys. Today's gonna be Rob doing running, and then Brandon's gonna do concussion rehab on Thursday. Or Brandon and I will be. I did the course as well, so I may as well say some stuff. On the concussions. On the concussions, yes. I got some research today, so oh, I have cool. to go through it. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for that one. It should be pretty good. I about concussions. It should be pretty good. It's uh, not considered so much like an impact to the brain. It's like a rapid stretch of the nerve fibers and things like that. So it's different. And rest and things like that, they say not to rest as long as a week, it's like 24 to 48 hours for the most part, because too much rest is detrimental to you. Mm. You get more symptoms and uh, yeah, you can start whenever Rob, Sure, yeah. I will be your cameraman. Sounds good. So I'm Rob, um, you may have seen me on here a couple times talking about running. Today is going to be sort of a, like running talk part three. If you missed the first couple, don't sweat it. We're going to cover the essentials from one and two. Um, and then we'll kind of like hit the ground running ah. and um, throw yeah. in some like different examples. I have some different runners that I'll be talking about today. Um, I know we talked about a few like last time as well who like provided some interesting case studies for us. So got a few new ones today. And then uh, today I also want to talk about a couple specific running injuries. So a little bit about Achilles tendonitis or Achilles tendinopathy. And then about um, kind of like a gluteal tendinopathy or um, greater trochanteric pain syndrome, you might hear it, hear it called. Um, so we'll kind of like use those two conditions as, um, as kind of an example of what like our running rehab is gonna look like. Cause we'll kind of follow the same like step-by-step -step framework for those two injuries um, as we would for other running injuries. So um, that'll just kind of be a little bit of, a, of an example of like what that exercise and progression will look like. And we'll talk about moving through the different stages, um, like when and how to do that, and what those are each going to look like too. Um, useful info for runners, and if anyone out there is like treating runners too. 
um, try to keep it like friendly for, for both groups. Um, we won't skip any steps. <laughs> we won't skip any steps. <laughs> yeah, it's not a skipping talk, it's a running talk. <laughs> Anyways, um, yeah, but like always, if you guys have any questions at all, um, I'm gonna kind of like skim over material that I've talked about before, and um, these talks are all available on YouTube now, I believe. Correct. So if, um, if something in the early going here kind of piques your interest, either ask me about it over the, um, Instagram or on the Zoom, and we'll kind of like delve into it a bit more for you. Or if you want to check those details out a bit further, hop back on YouTube. Um, the past couple, I think it's been Fridays for the most part, we've done running talks. So um, those are available on there too. Um, and that'll go a little bit more in depth into the material that we'll kind of brush over here first. So um, we've talked a few times about like what running injuries are. Um, in the context of this talk, we're kind of talking more about like the overuse types of injuries. So. Um, Stuff like kind of like your tendinopathies, um, patellofemoral pain syndrome, stress fractures, shin splints, those things that sort of develop over time versus um, like your acute injuries, like um, you step on a curb funny and sprain your ankle, or as an example, we'll see like uh, falling off a bicycle, broken collarbone, um, and bicycle, not a running injury anyways, but you wouldn't, I don't know, anyways, it's, it's some injuries that happen during running don't kind of follow the same course as the running injuries we'll talk about, um, like those examples. So we're talking more about kind of like your overuse injuries. Um, basically, like it's useful to kind of think about the tissues in the body, lower extremity in particular, as always having kind of like a turnover going on. So um, tendon, muscle, bone, it's always kind of being broken down by cells in the tissue and it's always being rebuilt at the same time. And that's true for like, I think any tissue in the body more or less. I'm not aware of any exceptions. Um, so basically the, the idea is that running injuries are gonna be caused by kind of an imbalance between that tissue breakdown and the tissue healing. So um, important to understand as well that when a tissue is loaded, your body is gonna make it stronger. So if, um, say you break an ankle and you're in a wheelchair for like eight weeks, for example, you're gonna lose bone density in your legs because you're not loading them. Um, your body still knows that you have legs, the legs are still there, but since they're not being used at all, your body's gonna kind of like divert attention to areas that are, that are being used more. There's always gonna be kind of, um, kind of a net growth in some areas, maybe a little bit of net deterioration in other areas. Um, anyways, you always have kind of that, that kind of balance happening. So the, uh, the big cause of running injuries is, is gonna be loading tissues that don't have the capacity to tolerate that load. So you can kind of think of um, kind of your tissues kind of reserves as being on one side and then the load you're imposing on them as being the other side. So um, for someone who uh, maybe doesn't have a running background, maybe you're just getting into it for the first time this spring, maybe you've got some extra time on your hands because you're not working or socializing or whatever else. Um, so for that brand new runner, their tissue capacity is gonna be like relatively low compared to someone who's been running like fairly routinely for a number of years. Um, and then if you kind of like push that even further, someone who's training for like competition is gonna be doing like potentially 100 kilometers a week plus, they're gonna have even greater tissue capacity. So if I'm kind of like that middle runner, if, um, if I jump into that kind of Olympic level training load, um, I'm gonna be kind of imparting damage on my tissues with my training, which is okay, as long as my tissues can keep up. But in that case, I would be kind of imparting a lot more damage than my legs could keep up with. So you're gonna get breakdown. Um, yeah, no matter what in that case, same thing with your beginner runner. If you jump in and try to do maybe 15 or 20 kilometers a week to start, depending on your body, and there's lots of different factors, um, age, gender, nutrition status, smoking, um, everything kind of goes into that. Um, you may be overloading your tissue with a relatively smaller volume, in which case you get the same result, one of these overuse injuries. Um, so yeah, basically, in order to kind of keep that from happening, you just have to sort of push just beyond what your tissues can handle, give them time to adapt, give them maybe a rest week here and there, and they'll keep up with you and you won't end up with, um, with kind of the same injury risk. You can never be 100% safe, but um, that's, that's kind of the general idea. So if you're, if you're overly sedentary, if you rest too much, which kind of parallels concussions, resting too much, then tissue is going to kind of de-adapt, it'll become 
softer, more sensitive, weaker. You try to get back in, injury all over again, you rest again, it gets weaker again. And we kind of get that um, kind of stress shielding, progressively less and less conditioned cycle going on the tissues. Um, that's something that can happen a lot. Um, either people trying to kind of maybe rehab their own injuries, where they're just resting and then jumping back into aggressively, or maybe they've seen like a professional who's maybe um, had the best intentions, but maybe rested them too much and, and kind of not progressively built them back into their training routine, um, kind of like hitting it step by step as they go. So those, those things can happen, but the idea is that we want, um, we kind of want our tissue load to just exceed our tissue um, kind of um, capacity for load. That's gonna kind of allow it to gradually increase. That can either be by maintaining our training volume, just kind of slightly higher from week to week. Um, again, rest weeks here and there, or strengthening exercises, for example, can also increase your, your load capacity and allow you to increase your training while avoiding injury. Um, anyways, that was kind of the whirlwind version of that, but um, that's kind of a foundation for, for what we're gonna talk about with running injuries. Um, yeah, so, so if we, we know that if we load our tissues too much, there's gonna be some kind of breakdown, and that can sort of be where biomechanics comes into it sometimes. Um, let's say you have a runner who's, um, maybe we talked about a little bit last time, about um, kind of that knee window, where a runner kind of runs with their feet too close to midline. So from the, from the hips, the femurs are sort of coming um, near each other at that distal end, or like that hip adduction, as we call it um, anatomically. Um, a runner like that might have more strain on the glutes, for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. So for that runner, if they're exceeding their tissue capacity, they might develop something like, um, like a gluteal tendonitis. If, um, if you have a runner who's more of a toe runner, who's putting a lot of strain through the, the calves, the Achilles, maybe the plantar fascia, that runner might end up with something like, um, like a calf strain, Achilles tendonitis, which is the other thing we'll talk about, or maybe some plantar fascia issues. So that's sort of where biomechanics can come in. It's not always the direct cause of an injury, but it's more like if you're gonna get injured because of your, um, your training errors and your overloading, then your biomechanics um, might determine the tissue that becomes injured. Um, yeah, again, biomechanics, not the only factor there too. Uh, people who are older are gonna tend to get more tendon issues. Um, runners who are younger might be more prone to something like, um, like a tibial stress fracture or patellofemoral pain syndrome which is pain kind of in the cartilage behind the kneecap, those kinds of things. Um, so lots of things go into it, but yeah, you can kind of think about biomechanics as being um, maybe what determines why one runner gets one injury and another runner gets another injury. Um, yeah, so talking biomechanics a little bit more, um, we talked a little bit about like Terry Fox last time too, and he has that really unique running style, right? Where he kind of like hops twice on the one leg and um, and how many like how many marathons did we say that he had run in a row? 140, or 140 something. 140 or something. 41. I think like 140 consecutive days. Yeah. Averaging yeah. 42 kilometers, something like that. Yeah. So like really unique kind of gait style. Um, you would never teach a person to run that way, but obviously this guy has like incredible tissue capacity because even though my running is a lot more conventional looking, I could never get away with with that kind of um, training load, right? Yeah. Like I couldn't do two marathons in a row if my life depended on it. So. So anyway, so biomechanics isn't everything. Um, everyone's gonna look a little bit different in their running. Um, we also talked about it, like a Chinese runner last time who kind of ran with her arms at her sides and set, um, I think like a, an Asian women's marathon record in 2003, something like that. Mm -hmm. So anyways, different things work for different people. We don't need to make everybody exactly the same when it comes to biomechanics, but, um, but if an athlete does have an injury or if you as a runner, if you do have an injury, Biomechanics is it's like one area that you might look at to address um, in order to uh, kind of get past that. Um, let's uh, let's pull up a video on here next. Do you mind kind of sliding the camera around and I'll screen share from here? I could do that. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Um Okay, so this is, um, here, I'll just let this run, but, um, this is the last oh, video I want to show. So this is, this is an athlete. He's a runner from Great Britain, Mo Farah, um, incredible runner. I think he won the Olympic 
5,000 and 10,000 meter races um, at two consecutive games, as well as like the world championships. They were calling it like a quadruple double at the time, which is kind of like, I don't like the double double, like kind yeah. of the Canadiana term. So his quadruple double was like a whole bunch of gold medals, which is like more impressive than a double double. Um, anyways, yeah. So after his, um, his kind of track running career like that, he switched to like the road races, the half marathon and the marathon. And um, not sure if we have it here or not. But um, anyways, if you look at, so here he is again, we'll pull up the, this is kind of a nice, if, um, if we sort of break down his stride, we talked last time about the importance of, um, of so kind of two like biomechanical things that, that I like to look at that are easy to observe and they have a big impact as far as injury prevention goes. So the first one is overstride and the second one is the knee window. So with overstride, basically you don't want that landing, that, or your landing foot to be landing too far ahead of your center of mass. Um, so if, if you can kind of see my cursor here, we don't want this foot landing too far out ahead of the body. If we do, we just get a lot of ground reaction force going up the other direction. That's gonna increase strain on the, on the knee, on the hip. Um, the other thing that we don't wanna to get too much of is, is closing of what we call the knee window. So if you're watching your runner from behind or if you're maybe on the treadmill at the gym, not the gym right now, um, looking at yourself in the mirror, basically you wanna see a little bit of air between your knees as you run. If, um, if the knees are coming too close together, so if the feet are coming too close towards midline as you run, that's going to increase um, kind of the force at the lateral, at the outside of the hips, the lateral hips in the, in the glute tendons. Um, it's also going to kind of change what's going on at the knees a little bit. You can get a little bit of, um, of kind of some of torque you don't want there. Um, and then same goes through the, through the tibia, through the lower leg, and down at the ankle too. So those are our two big like biomechanical things. We talked more about those a couple of weeks back. Um, but yeah, basically your overstride and your knee window. Um, and in talking about, about overstride last time, we talked about Elio Kipchoge. He was the, the Kenyan runner who ran like the sub two hour marathon this past fall, which is incredible. And we talked about um, his, like his cadence and his stride length. So if I recall, I think he was running at about 190 steps per minute during his, um, his marathon, which is a pretty quick, um, a pretty quick gait. Um, lots of runners that you'll see are more like around the 170 to 180 mark. Um, and if you, if you analyze Mo Farah, he's a, he's a bit taller than um, Elliot was, and, and he's gonna take about 180 steps per minute. So his, um, his cadence is like, that's a fair bit slower. Mm -hmm. um, and his marathon times are not that much different from, from Kipchoge's. So I think, I think um, Mo Farah's, I think he is like a 205 marathon or 205.11, something like that. So he's like, he's also an incredibly fast marathoner. Um, but he's, he's going to tend to take slightly like slower strides, but at the same time, slightly longer strides. He's a few inches taller. Um, he's also famous for having kind of a, like a long sort of like bouncy, bouncy gait, um, is Mo Farah. So those are, those are like a few things that can be important as well with the running cadence. Um, what I found interesting, I was watching a video and it was analyzing this athlete. So again, Mo Farah. And it was looking at, at him running the, the 5,000 meter, which is a five kilometer run versus, um, versus the, the marathon. Um, so obviously you're gonna be running at a different, and you can kind of talk about knee window. And even though the camera is maybe not directly behind him here, you can see that you don't lose that space between the knees. So his feet are not coming excessively towards midline as he goes. We'll lose it here just because the camera angle is a bit more, a bit more to the side. Um, but if you compare, yeah, so if you compare, this is, this is a training run, of course, but if you compare his gait during the, the 5,000 meter versus the marathon, um, so he's, he's hitting about 180 steps per minute during the, the 5K. During the marathon, though, exactly the same, 180 steps per minute. So he doesn't change his cadence at all. So he's not taking slower steps at all during his marathon. Um, but with that being said, he's not running the same like velocity either, right? You don't run the same mm -hmm. pace for a 5K as you do for a, for a 26 miler. So for the 5K, he's running about 236 um, minutes per kilometer, and for the marathon, about 259. So a good like 23 seconds per kilometer slower. So if he's taking the same number of steps, you can imagine that he's just taking steps that are gonna be slightly shorter during the marathon, right? Um, because a person's speed is gonna be determined by the number of steps they take times the length of each step divided by time. 
So if you're keeping the stride rate the same, you know that the, the stride length is gonna be shortening up a little bit, um, which is interesting. One, one um, kind of biomechanical intervention we talked about last time is um, if a runner tends to kind of speed up their cadence by five to 10%, that's gonna have um, generally good impacts as far as those two kind of um, gait problems we talked about. So it's gonna tend to decrease your overstride and it's also going to, um, to tend to kind of improve your knee window or decrease kind of that crossing. Those two kind of go together. So um, anyways, that's just a point that's kind of interesting. So even when he slows down for his longer runs, he's still taking like frequent steps. Um, another great runner is Scott Jurek. He's like um, an ultra runner. So he set lots of records like over like the greater than marathon distance anyways. So up to like a hundred milers and plus. And he talked about hill running. So when he's going up a hill during his, um, his tremendously long runs, he, um, he would think about trying to keep his step rate the same, but just shorten up his stride. And he talked about it as being um, like changing gears on a bicycle. So if you're going up a hill on a bike, you might try to keep that same pedal rate, but you're gonna change your gear so that you can keep going without um, exhausting yourself. So you're kind of keeping the, the step rate the same, but shortening up the stride a little bit. And um, just an example there about how um, Mo Farah does that when he's doing his 5K versus his marathon. So um, one thing to think about there anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah, and he's also kind of, Mo Farah also tends to get quite a bit of like vertical oscillation, um, more so when he was doing the shorter distance stuff. Um, based on like kind of analysis, analyses of his running I've seen since then, it seems that for the marathon in shortening his, um, in um, shortening up his stride a little bit, he gets a little bit less of that vertical oscillation. So maybe a little bit um, less wasted energy, which makes sense like over those greater distances that, um, that efficiency becomes even more important. And I've been calling him Mo Farah, but he's actually Sir Mo Farah. He got knighted mm. in 2017. Oh, he's that wow. good at running. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Um, anyways, he also had Achilles tendonitis, I think in the last couple of years. Maybe it was even this spring. I think he pulled out of a half marathon this spring with Achilles tendonitis. So mm. that's, that's sort of the next condition that we'll talk about. Um, okay, one more video I wanna show just while we're up here. This is, um, I was telling Sunny before we came on, but this is like my favorite little running video of all time, so I really wanted to share it. So this is um, Canadian runner Simon Whitfield. This is at the 2008 Olympic Games um, in Beijing. So he had won the gold medal in the triathlon in 2000. Um, so this is eight years later, so I don't know, kind of maybe past his prime a little bit. He's more of a runner than a biker or a swimmer. So he was like quite a bit behind earlier in the race. Towards the end, he's up here in the lead pack, which is incredible. But you can kind of see the last couple of kilometers here, like he's really dropped off. So these are, these are kind of like your three, maybe like younger, faster guys up here. Simon Whitfield, a little older, not quite keeping up with the pack. You can see in the previous little clip there, he has the, like a white visor on right there. And I couldn't find video of the, of the, whole, of the whole sequence, but um, I remember it at the time. Um, so he's kind of behind, these three guys are pulling away from him, he's fading off. He pulls the visor off, throws it off to the side. In this video, you can see the visor's gone. And then if he's kinda, he kinda chases down the pack and we don't see that part here, but, but now he's out in front. So he's kinda come from behind, um, past these three other runners, taking first place. And then in the home stretch, he doesn't quite have enough gas and the German ends up passing him. But um, anyways, incredible moment. I remember it was sort of from this angle on the broadcast takes the hat off, throws it into the stands, and then takes off and catches the three, um, the three other runners in the last couple of kilometers. So anyways, that's, um, doesn't have much to do with what I was talking, but just an incredible moment in, um, in running and in Canadian running. That'd be extremely like, exciting to watch that, that all unfold. It was, it was exciting, yeah. Did you watch it live, Rob? I watched it live, oh, yeah. Gosh, I don't watch like a ton <laughs> of Olympics, but um, I remember that moment anyways. That's like one of the, my favorite Olympic moment, and I think my favorite like running moment was, um, was that. Um, yeah, anyways, I think he fell off a bike a year or two later and broke his collarbone, mm. and then ended up retiring, I think maybe a couple of years after that. So that's an example of like, again, like I said, um, kind of a sports injury that's maybe not like an overuse injury, but like a different kind of thing. Yeah. Fall and break your, your collarbone. Anyways, that's all I had on there. We can flip this back around.
so um, yeah anyway so injury wise um, basically injuries are going to happen when we overtrain um, and we're going to end up with breakdown in tissues depending on, um, on different factors like our age, gender, biomechanics, the way we're put together, all that kind of stuff. Um, a couple common injuries um, are Achilles tendonitis and um, uh, kind of luteal tendonitis, which is also on the side. Um, you, get, you get interesting like tissue changes with these tendonitises. So in a healthy tendon, the cells, they're all kind of um, like longitudinally oriented like a rope um, and they're really good at resisting tension, but they really hate to be compressed. So um, if we think about kind of that like luteal tendon um, on the side of the hip right here, it has the IT band going over top of it, which can, which can compress it on the side. Um, down at the Achilles where it attaches onto the heel bone, you can get a lot, of Achille a lot of Achilles compression on the under surface of the tendon as a result of the calcaneus pushing back into it during running. So that's, that's like one common area to get tendonitis in the Achilles. Um, yeah, interestingly, if you think about like the tissue with a tendinopathy like that, um, if you, so you have your healthy tendon, longitudinally oriented, um, high fiber density, so lots of type one collagen. With, um, with the breakdown that happens with the tendinopathy, um, you get stuff like more water, um, more water in the tendon, you get these um, these gag molecules that are like, hydrophilic, and they sort of kind of pull more water in, so you get that kind of enlarged appearance. Um, you lose a lot of that nice longitudinal orientation. There's different things that go on, but basically, um, there's lots of cell death, lots of cell metabolism. There's like, lots of turnover of cells, and you just end up with a whole bunch of kind of um, disorganized collagen in there. More type three, which is kind of like your um, kind of padding type collagen versus your type one collagen. So it ends up looking like, um, I don't know, if this is kind of your spaghetti, it ends up looking more like, um, like uh, I don't know, penny noodles or something mm -hmm. where you don't have kind of those like long, nice, continuous fibers. Everything's sort of broken up and disorganized. Different passing noodles are facing different directions. And it's not really effective for like um, prevention tension. Um, anyways, the, the bottom line is to kind of get those, those, um, those maladaptive, cha maladaptive changes to come back, we have to load the tendon. Um, with that being said, it's often overload that causes the injury in the first place, right? So a little bit of a, a little bit of a thing to think about there. And and again, if we jump back into the training volume that caused the injury, even after resting, where symptoms have kind of subsided, resting won't make the in, won't make the tissue stronger again. So when you jump back in, you're going to run into issues all over again if you go too hard too fast. Um, if we kind of go back to our like our healthy pre-injury tendon, the um, the different forces that it has to contend with, <clears throat> we can kind of break it down into like peak load, which is the point in the running cycle where there is the most force through that tendon. So um, like in the case of the glute, kind of on single leg landing where it's stabilizing the pelvis, it has to contend with about three and a half times body weight at that point. So if I'm 160 pounds, you can do the math, but it's like it's a lot of weight through that tendon. That's going to be your peak force. Um, the Achilles, I think it can take even as much as like 7.5 times body weight, which is again like very huge. Um, and the, the peak force for the Achilles is going to happen kind of just before toe off. Um, so in that plant stage where the ankle sort of maximally dorsiflexed just before you start to toe off. Um, so yeah, peak force has to be contended with. There's the, like the energy storage, which is um, basically like as the tendon is lengthened, it's going to store energy. And then as the muscle contracts, it's going to kind of release that stored energy. So you can sort of think of that as like a plyometric exercise, which is how we rebuild that. And it's kind of that like bouncy nature of our tendons and muscles as we run. And that's again, very important both for the glute and for the, um, for the Achilles. The, um, the third thing that that tendon is contending with tendon is contending with is um, just the repetitive nature of the running so kind of our training volume so the fact that there could be like 10 20 40 thousand steps during a, during a longer road race and so it's kind of that repetitive um, repetitive nature of the exercise so basically for rehab we're going to take those one at a time so um, our first phase is going to be is going to be rest 
we want to give things a chance to settle down a little bit, and then as soon as possible, we want to get up into, into our, our first exercise phase, which is going to involve um, kind of like strengthening basically, so loading the tendon and trying to build back the adaptation for those peak loads. So um, like for the glute, for example, I can demo here on the floor. I think we tilt this down. stabilizing the pelvis that way. We can do an exercise like a clamshell. Um, that's going to look like this. So my hip is staying firmly positioned above my, my lower, my left hip, and then I'm just bringing the knees apart. I'm looking to feel this primarily kind of in behind the greater trochanter here, or in behind that lateral hip bone. Um, you may be starting this exercise without a band, just working against gravity, but when possible, you do want to load it up. Um, some studies looking at um, strength exercises for tendonitis have found that the results are way better if you can load it with at least 70% of your 1RM. So um, you'll be starting lighter, maybe something like three sets of 15 for your exercise, but, um, but as, as things kind of start to heal and start to re-strengthen again, you want to be working towards exercise with a lower number of reps. Um, thinking like maybe four sets of six, something like that. With, um, with kind of muscle fatigue and failure at that last repetition. So um, that's, that's one way to load it up there, starting with maybe 315s on your unloaded clamshell, but eventually getting some TheraBand on there and challenging it that way. Another way that you can challenge the glute here is with a, a bridge type exercise. So if I'm looking to work my, my left glute more this time, um, if I'm starting again with kind of those 315s, it might be something like a, a simple bridge exercise with, with some recruitment back here. And then again, as I get stronger, if I want to get some more load on that side, I can do things like straighten my right leg out a little bit. So now my glute bridge is going to be more loading my left side than my right. And then eventually you can throw some weight on there as well, up on the pelvis to get some more resistance. Um, so again, we'll be starting with, um, with less load, higher repetitions, but when possible, working up to um, get some weight onto it and kind of working towards those um, like little, uh, more sets, less reps to challenge it that way. That's gonna, that's gonna be, um, those are a couple examples anyways of what that first strengthening phase is gonna look like. When, um, when those start to get easy, when you start to plateau there a little bit, that's a sign that it's time to kind of move into that um, that um, energy storage phase, which is going to be more like your plyometrics. So, for the plyometrics, move this over here. Basically, you want to be simulating that, um, that kind of energy storage and an energy release cycle that you're going to be getting during your run. So, just for an example, and this might not be what you start with with your plyometrics, but even something like a hop exercise where you're kind of absorbing and then pushing again further. So as you land, your glutes are gonna be kind of working eccentrically or contracting and lengthening. And then as you push off, you're gonna be getting that kind of power out of the glutes where you're getting that energy release after storing. Um, and progressing that, you might do something like a box jump where you're landing and then again, um, pushing off again from there, so having those two different components to it. Um, that's what's going to help to kind of retrain that energy storage and release portion, which was kind of our second element that the tendons have to contend against. And then um, the third element, again, is going to be kind of um, like volume loading. So that's going to be kind of getting your athlete working back up towards the training cycle. I'm a little short of breath after that. <laughs> but, um, but yeah. Even during your, if we go all the way back to like phase zero, which is our rest phase, you want the athlete, or you want to be, um, if you are the athlete, to be doing what you can without um, triggering too much pain. So um, let's say I have that kind of that glute tendonitis, and it comes on after about 20 minutes of running. 
That means it's okay for me to be doing 20 minutes of running. I probably don't want to push it much beyond that, but if I can do 20 minutes without any pain, there's no reason not to be doing that like two or three days a week. Um, <clears throat> if my tendonitis is more severe, if I can't really run at all, as soon as I take steps through it, it starts to give me pain right away, then you want to be looking at, um, at changing it up, maybe like a, like a cycle program, pool program, uphill walking program, something like that. Um, you want to be getting like as much, as much load as you can through that lower extremity anyways to keep things as conditioned as possible, which will get you back to sports sooner. So even during the rest phase, it's not, um, it's not bed rest, it's not Netflix on the couch for like four weeks. It's like doing what you can, not more than you can, but doing what you can. Um, and the more you can maintain that through the first, that stage zero, if you can maintain that through the first three stages, it's gonna make that return to activity in stage four that much easier. You're gonna be starting much further along, um, along that progression and you'll have less, less distance to go before you get back to your, kind of your pre-injury training volume. But um, it is a process, like it's not, these things that take like eight weeks, 12 weeks before you sort of um, kind of get back to what you were doing typically. Um, that can be even like an optimistic prognosis depending on, um, some people come in and they've had these tendinopathies that have been going on for years and years. So in that case, you can imagine things are probably deconditioned quite a bit and you might be looking at even a few weeks more before you're kind of getting into that. A little, a little shadowy, eh? before you're getting back up to, up to full speed with your training. So again, we had kind of that initial rest stage, then some strength work, then some plyometric work, and then kind of building back into your routine. And those were examples for the glute tendon. Um, but we can go through like a similar series for the Achilles. So, uh, let's tip this down again. So the Achilles is of course the tendon at the back of the heel, that heel cord. So it's going to connect the calf with the heel bone, and it, it's going to be loaded when you're when you're kind of doing that active calf contraction. So like a calf raise, for example, is going to be loading the tendon. Um, and in running, if you're looking at my left side, the tendon's going to be most loaded kind of here at that peak dorsiflexion on my left, just before toe off. Um, yeah, we'll talk a bit more about how to sort of like protect these tendons as well in a minute. So um, rest phase is going to look the same. If I can do a certain amount of training without getting pain, I do want to be doing that. Um, but when I've rested for maybe a few days, maybe a week, things have kind of settled down a little bit. I don't have pain at rest anymore. I can do a bit of walking and I'm okay. Then I want to build into some strength work from there. So um, that can be as simple as like a two foot calf raise off the floor. I like these ones because you can, you can shift your weight from side to side to increase or decrease the weight on your symptomatic leg. So if a calf raise is too uncomfortable for me initially, I can take 80% of my weight to the right side in order to offload that left one until it's basically um, pushing like a very small amount of weight. And as I get stronger, I can be progressively loading more onto my left side until eventually I'm just working a single leg calf raise. Um, yeah, so off the floor is fantastic. You can do these, you've probably seen off a step as well, where your toe is on the step and your heel can kind of fall down past the stair. Um, those are great because they allow you to work the tendon through a more full range. But at the same time, remember the tendon was most loaded when we were in kind of a dorsiflex position during our run. So um, if we do sort of have that presentation with our physiotherapist, you might choose not to use that stair because you may not want to get that kind of um, that amount of load kind of in that low um, that low calf raise position. You might choose just to keep it from the floor as you move from, from two feet to one feet. Um, similar to the glutes, we'll try to keep it all consistent. We started with about three sets of 15 to get things going, but over time you want to be um, you want to be progressing the weight so that you're working against a higher percentage of your one rep max. Um, this can be tricky with the, with the calf because it's a very strong muscle. So, um, I mean, with a single leg calf raise, you have your entire body weight in that leg, and it's not uncommon for people to be able to do a few dozen repetitions. So, in that case, you're gonna really have to bring in some external loading. So that can be, um, like lots of gyms have gym equipment, where you can kind of get a loaded bar on the calf and work it that way. 
If you're working at home though, which is much more common, you might have to get creative and throw like a backpack on, put some textbooks or cookbooks in there to really increase the load that you're going to be applying to the calf. Um, and even with that, you might have a hard time finding um, enough resistance to be able to do like um, sets of six reps, for example, where the sixth rep is difficult. So you have to kind of do your best with that one. But yeah, I like the backpack full of books, um, single leg, and you can get quite a bit of weight on it that way. If you're in a gym, of course, that's fantastic. You can get on the leg press machine, work the calf that way, or like barbell, that kind of thing, and work your calf raise if you can do so safely. So different ways of, um, of loading the muscle up. But same principles, you want to start with about like 315s, so higher, um, higher reps, lower weight, but progress as fast as possible towards a larger percentage of your 1RM with something like four sets of six as kind of a guideline. Um, so again, that's kind of our rest phase, our strength phase. So getting from there again into our plyo phase, once we start to plateau with the strength exercises, um, plyo for the calf is no problem. You can do something like kind of a wall push-up position and then just kind of bouncing. So with that one, we're kind of letting the body weight fall down. The calf is sort of eccentrically stopping that and then pushing us back up again. With that one again, you can start two feet and that becomes pretty easy. You can switch it up to a single foot. And again, a lot of exercises you want to be slow and controlled, but these ones you want to be like more fast and kind of ballistic with them. Um, again, we're not starting rehab with these ones. That would be too provocative for the tendon. This is something we're sort of working towards. Um, when those become pretty easy, something as simple as like hopping. Again, we're getting that nice kind of eccentric on the way down, followed by a quick concentric popping back up again. And then to increase the load even a bit more from there, we can do forward hopping, something like that. Who knew rehab exercises could be so fun? <laughs> um, but yeah, but basically we're following that same framework as we have for the glutes, keeping it consistent, keeping it simple, moving from rest to strength to plyo, and then from there again, same thing for phase four, we're kind of building up our, um, our activity again. Um, this is where like some of the, here I'll pull in a bit more. This is where some of the, like, the biomechanics and even um, like kind of external aids can help a little bit too. If, um, if we know that as a runner, we do have kind of that crossover step a little bit where our feet come close towards midline or, um, or even just we were put together, some people have wider hips. So they're going to tend to have more of that hip adduction again. We know that that increases load through that glute tendon. So that's where we might try to make some changes to a runner's, um, to a runner's gait. Um, so if we're trying to kind of decrease that kind of that, um, that valgus where the knees are coming together, we might have a runner think about running with their feet landing beneath their hips rather than beneath their belly button in that plane. So keeping the legs just a little bit more um, towards what we call abduction or a little bit more vertical with the femurs versus um, kind of sloping in on a diagonal. Um, again, increasing your cadence by five to 10% can help out with that as well automatically. Um, and then for the Achilles example, um, we talked a lot about like different foot strikes last time. And if anyone wants us to get into that again, just post a question. But otherwise it's in the video from last time. Um, but there's, there's potentially things you could do by modifying, modifying your foot strike to help with the Achilles. Um, yeah, like my own example, um, running a few weeks ago, I was increasing my volume in the spring and I got a bit of right Achilles soreness. So I wanted to keep, I didn't want to rest excessively. So one thing I did was I changed up my footwear. Um, typically I wear a shoe with a very low heel, but I switched to an older pair that I had with, which had a little bit more build up under the heel. And, um, if you kind of think about the, like the biomechanics when you're kind of at the, just about to push off. And again, that's the, the point of highest tension through the Achilles. If you put something extra under the heel, that's gonna kind of lessen that angle a little bit. So it takes some strain off the Achilles having a little bit more. Um, so in my case, it was changing the footwear up, but it could be something like a small heel lift that you put into your shoe, just temporarily to give the Achilles a bit of a break there as well. Um, and for me, that was enough. I was able to maintain my same training volume. Um, and then Achilles pain went away and I started like cycling back and forth between the two pairs of footwear um, just to keep everything kind of smooth and happy. But those are a couple examples of things you can modify um, to kind of help with that protection phase initially 
and to help to make that kind of that fourth phase where you're getting your athlete back into running a little smoother as well. So that's, that's how I think about running injuries. Um, again, to summarize, kind of being that like tissue overload, things can't keep up, therefore things break down. Um, with, you want to rest a little bit, then you want to get into those, those rehab phases right away. So starting with your strength, then working towards your energy storage, which is going to be your plyometrics, and then working back into your volume, so kind of building up um, your number of steps again from there. That's, that's, <clears throat> that's it. Um, any questions at all? Anything like that? <clears throat> yeah, guys, so while you type it out, thank you to Rob again for part like three this time. I think so, yeah. Part three. Thanks to anyone who came back for the third part. <laughs> Never topics to run out of, so. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks again, Rob. Yeah, no problem. We'll leave it on for a few more minutes for any questions. And um, yeah, so tomorrow, guys, whoever's going to cop on to Instagram, don't be offended if we're not looking at the screen. We're doing a, a, a part of a series for U of A um, for the, the alumni, and, and it's about working from home. So we're going to go through a stretching program, a HIT program as well. Um, so feel free to attend that. Um, should be great. We'll have a, a video for that as well posted. Um, and I got a question. Thoughts on stretching calves or glutes with the injuries you talked about? Or you find it's loading that is more needed? Um, short answer, like loading I think is more needed. Um, like based on what I've kind of like read and seen recently um, people who know a lot more about this than myself are saying that yeah like opposite for bone right bone loves to be kind of loaded longitudinally doesn't like that tension um, tendon needs the tension doesn't like the compression um, and a lot of positions that we go into for like glute stretches for example there's going to be a lot of compression on the glute tendon um, via the IT band and, um, and then with that kind of Achilles mechanism, with, um, with calf stretching, a lot of the time there's going to be compression on the undersurface of the Achilles from the calcaneus. Like, I think another important thing is that um, like, like those kind of tissue changes we talked about, it's not that the tendon is tight, it's more that it's, um, it becomes like, it's, kind of, it's more of the opposite, like it doesn't get um, excessively tight and stiff, it actually gets like more pliable and softer um, with the tendinopathy. So yeah, it's really more the loading. You want to be increasing the tendon stiffness um, rather than like decreasing the stiffness through the, through the chain. Um, but with that being said, like you also, you do want to treat what you see. So if, um, if the athlete that you're seeing or if it's yourself, if you do have like really tight calves or like really tight glutes, um, it's not a bad idea to be like working into end range with those, but you might choose to do something like, um, like a calf raise off a step, um, where you're kind of like allowing your heels to go down until you feel a comfortable stretch through the back of the calf as kind of a, as kind of a, a stretch with a strength component to it rather than like a static hold. Um, but yeah, so that's, I think the loading is definitely much more important. There's probably a place for stretching kind of in that context, but um, I know I used to do lots of stretching with, with these kinds of tendinopathies, and I've moved away from that quite a bit. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm more about the loading now. Um, and again, if your athlete has a lot, of, a lot of muscle tightness, you might choose like to do some um, kind of stretch strengthening, like the calf raise off the step example. Um, but yeah, but keeping in mind that you really want to be like minimizing compression on the tendon. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a long answer. Does that make sense though? Exactly. Just said that makes sense, Rob. Thanks. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, another one more question we got. Rob, do you have any suggestions for books or seminars or courses that are good for learning further about running biomechanics and injuries? Question Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, like, um, I don't know, like, my, um, my go-to guy for running injuries is Dr. Richard Willey um, in Montana. He has, um, he has an online course that you can access through Physio Network. Um, 
it's not a free course, but it's not like it's not too expensive either. I think it's about two or three hours long, and um, yeah, and he does. He um, yeah, he's very involved in like um, in running. He's a runner himself. He was part of the. Um, I think it was like the American Journal of Sports Medicine, like the new clinical practice guideline on IT band syndrome, if I'm not mistaken. So he's very much into like the research and that kind of stuff too. He's not um, he's not just a physio who runs. He's like a he's a real he's the real guy to listen to on the topic. So that's that's one I would I would uh, definitely recommend. And anything he's written as well, pop on the databases and search him up, Doctor Rich Willie Richard Willie. Awesome. That should answer that question. Yeah. Megan has a thumbs up. Thanks, Megan. But like, there's I don't know. There's no limit to what you can read about running injuries. Um, like Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. It's like uh, it's a really popular running book from like I don't know. It's must probably at least a decade old now. It's kind of what like kicked off a lot of like the barefoot running and like minimalist running trends of the last number of years. Um, I found the book like incredibly entertaining and um, and like motivating too. I find that when I'm like reading about running, it makes me want to run too, which is like which is an extra little bonus spinoff. But um, but yeah, like any I guess anything like like that, which is, it's not fiction, but it's not like a peer reviewed scientific journal either. There's gonna be like a lot of like anecdote that comes into it. Um, people might choose to like, I don't know, cherry pick studies to support their opinions, that kind of thing. So I think like those kinds of books, like they're fantastic reads, but um, I think I'm the most skeptical person I know. I never take anything, I never believe anything that I hear until I can kind of verify it as much as possible. So I'd say like, if you are like reading from different like from magazines or from like nonfiction books or whatever like just remember like this is a person's opinion and it, it kind of it's um they're gonna be talking about running through their own lens from their perspective so um, yeah like do your own research too um, see if what you're kind of listening to makes sense and um, be skeptical about information that you hear awesome that answers that question for me and then we'll give it Two more minutes, and then if there's any more questions, we'll, well, Rob will answer them. I will sit patiently. <laughs> Running's an interesting one. It is, yeah. Um, it's like a whole, it's a whole thing. I find I just, uh, yeah, I just have to keep up with it. I thought about it. I'm like, every time I start in the summer, I just have a hard time, but the idea would be to not, <laughs> to not stop. <laughs> yeah, I, I find it's like one of those things, like, the more people do it, like the more comfortable they get with their running, like the more distance they can handle and like the more they fall in love with it. Yeah. I, I like it from like a rehab perspective because you can kind of use like the same framework we talked about today, like rest, strengthen, plyometric, and then volume. Mm -hmm. And you can apply that to like any running overuse injury. Yeah. So like we talked about like Achilles and glutes today, but um, you could apply that to like patellic pain syndrome, um, like patellar tendinopathy, like Mm -hmm. hamstring tendinopathy like yeah just put anything you'd see in the lower extremity with running because i know even, even sorry oh sorry go ahead even with like some of the research i did for squats they're like it, the implications for runners was quite strong yeah to, for them to do deep like depth squats um and then like squat jumps plyos all that kind of stuff so for sure yeah there's a question from megan i may have missed this earlier in the presentation but do you prefer barefoot running minimalist running would you prefer comfy shoes so rob has a good talk about shoes in parts one and two, <laughs> which are on YouTube. So that, that will answer that question for sure. Yeah. We did mention it, yes, part one and part two. Um, yeah, so have yeah. a look at that, Megan. You can, you can uh, watch the videos or the just brief look. brief answer is like, they're, they're all good. It's yeah. really whatever feels good for a person. Different, like different footfall patterns, like if we're looking at forefoot versus, or heel versus like toe running, for example, injury rates tend to be like similar, but you're gonna get different types of injuries. Um, yeah, so similar rates, different types of injuries. So if a person is really struggling with a persistent injury, it can be worth making changes there. But I think most studies have shown that for like general running population, there's no point in like shoehorning everyone into one running style. Um, so it's really whatever feels good for the person. Perfect. You said, okay, I will lol. <laughs> so she will look at the videos, but that, that's a good answer. That does sum it up. So yeah, yeah, this is good questions, guys. Great questions.
I think like doing some barefoot running too. Like, so I'm not like a, a barefoot runner or anything like that, but I think you can like use that as a training tool. So if, um, if you're traditionally like a regular like shoe runner, or sidewalk runner, um, if you have a nice patch of grass, like a little park or a backyard, like work in like a few minutes of barefoot running on the grass into your training program. Um, like, and kind of be open to changing your gait style a little bit. Like without shoes on, you'll probably find that you do land more on your forefoot because um, you need to have that little bit of shock absorption. Like landing on a bare heel is not going to be comfortable. Um, and yeah, even just doing that, you're going to see things like you're, you're probably going to shorten your stride up a little bit and increase your turnover a bit, which, um, which are good things to carry over into your um, like shoed road running. So like that overstride we talked about, you're probably not going to overstride barefoot running. So you can use that as a tool to sort of like get a feel for like how your body wants to move without shoes on. And then you can transfer some of that over into your, your road running. Perfect. But I don't own a pair of Vibram five fingers. Is that what they're called? Five fingers? Yes, five fingers. I got two pairs. Oh, there you go. I looked at research with that too. And People were suing that company left, right, and center, but their 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 soles, like the Vibram soles, are in a lot of different uh, brands of shoes. Yeah, yeah, I and they're with Vibram unbelievable. Soles. Yeah, it's just Vibram had a five finger shoe and led to a lot of issues in court. But I think a lot of that was people not listening to the recommendations. They were having like stress fractures and stuff like that. Um, but the company said to wear it like half an hour a day. I got it for hiking, personally, like initially for hiking, just because I could jump in water, jump out, and, and quickly do things without switching shoe wear or taking them off. Um, but <laughs> hiking-wise, they're, they're a bit tough because you can feel rocks and stuff like that. So. Oh, yeah, I guess yeah. so. Right? Like, mine were thick, but yeah. I have them. I don't wear them too often anymore, but yeah. people freak out. <laughs> All right, guys. So thank you, Rob. Very good work, as per usual. Um, Helps me because I get to but now I can be proficient in tr treating runners. Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> for sure, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. We'll all see you guys tomorrow. All right, Bob. Bye. See ya. <laughs>